Well, this morning we take a, a short detour from Zephaniah, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 to 4. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do pray. I think these are four phenomenal verses that point us to great things. And we ask that you would open our eyes this morning, touch our hearts and our minds, our affections, and draw us more to you. Some have had very difficult weeks. Some have had difficult days. And some of us just struggle with wanting to hear your word. And so pray that you would gently wrap your arms around us all and draw us into the care of the great shepherd. Lord, strengthen and empower me this morning to proclaim your truth. We pray these things in Christ's name and for your glory and our good. Amen. So let me just start with a couple questions this morning. I want to think about maybe the weeks that you would have leading up to a vacation or a, a good trip. What's, what is it that you think about? Or say you're engaged and your wedding is a few weeks or months away. What occupies your mind? Or maybe you're graduating and you're starting a new job or just you're about to start a new job now. What do you start to think about? What, what is it that, that takes on your thoughts? Or honestly, just in normal everyday life, what is it that occupies your mind? You know, when you have those things, you, you know that, that that starts to take place and it starts to affect what you think and what you do. Because as your mind is focused on those things, one of the things that it does is it constrains your actions. It's amazing how what we set our minds upon can really control the things we do and how we react and how we live. You see, what you think about is extremely influential. What you love, what you commit yourself to, what you engage your heart and your affections upon is, it's a massive rudder directing the ship of your life. In the text we have before us this morning, the Apostle Paul gives one overarching command. But he doesn't just give a command, he gives clear reasons why we should follow that command as well. And the command is simple, isn't it? Seek the things that are above. Seek the things that are above. But simple does not mean easy or unimportant. Just because it's a simple statement, we can understand those words, doesn't make it easy or any less important. This command is vital to our lives as believers, to, to lives that endure, to lives that are full of joy and hope. So now, as, as we pick up this text halfway through Paul's letter, uh, I don't want to just start there. I think we need to, to have a little bit of a recap of the context of where we're at, and so I'm going to give you the quickest recap of two, two chapters that I can. Well, in these first two chapters, Paul has lifted up the glory, the, the supremacy, the sufficiency, the beauty, and the preeminence of Christ, and he has shared his ambition to... Uh, 
and his struggle to proclaim Christ to the entire world. And he shared this in part to help his readers. He's lifted up who Christ is to help his readers not be deceived and lured away by things which might seem wise, but are not actually at all of God. And so then we come to these first words. If then you have been raised with Christ. Now, phrasing this in such a manner, I think shows Paul's skills his rhetorical skills, because it forces the reader to think about what he's saying. If then you have been raised with Christ, it makes you go, okay, I, have to, I need to assent to that. I need to think about what he wrote. It has a similar feel, I think, to 2 Corinthians 13, 5, where Paul wrote, examine yourselves to see whether you were in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. See, in some sense, their response and ours will show our true colors. So then, what does, the Paul want the, what does Paul want the believer to respond to? What does he want them to follow? What, what does he want us to do in order to, to demonstrate that we have been raised with Christ? Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Paul really gives essentially one command here, but he gives it twice. But what does this mean? What does this mean? What, what is Paul calling believers to do? Well, he says, seek. Seek where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, why clarify this? He could have just said, seek the things that are above. But he says, where Christ is. Well, this is where context pays dividends in our study of Scripture. Because already in this letter, Paul has made clear that Christ is the head of the church. He's head of his body, the one from whom believers receive their nourishment, their strength. That he is, if you went back to chapter 1, starting in verse 15, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16, by him all things were created. 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's the one we're called to seek. That's where we're called to seek is where this one is, the image of the invisible God, the fullness of God. In Him, everything holds together. Now, if we think about where we are as well in the letter, Paul has just finished a scathing rebuke of man-made religion. Of, of false teaching that was threatening the church at the time. And he, he stated that all, the, the, that the false teachers proposed the, the rules, the rituals, the rites, the ceremonies, these things that have an appearance of wisdom have absolutely, and he says in verse 23 of chapter 2, they have absolutely no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So these rites, these rituals, these disciplines by themselves are worthless in stopping our fight against sin. And yet that's what we gravitate to so much, is if I just do this, if I just do this, if I just do this, I'll beat it. And he says, no, that has no value in and of itself in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So Paul's admonition then, his command to seek the things above is for our good. It's the, it's the counterbalance to that. So therefore, we are to seek Christ to, to do so wholly and completely. And that verb seek, it implies putting forth absolutely great effort, strenuous effort, doing so in order to possess what you seek. It's, it's not a, a seeking to discover, oh, look, hey, there's the Grand Canyon kids, but it's actually to take kind of possession of it, to, to not just discover it, but to make it your own, to grasp it, 
to take hold, to treasure it. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a number of parables related to the kingdom of God. And two short ones start in verse 44 of Matthew 13. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he just stayed there. Oh, wait. No. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What Jesus is saying is there is such immense worth to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that everything else we have pales in comparison. He's showing the worth of the things of God, the, the things that are above. He's actually showing the worth of Himself. This hidden treasure, this pearl is worth far more than anything else. And there is tremendous, there's overwhelming joy in the heart when we find it, when we grasp it, when we, when we see it, and in obtaining it, in possessing it. And the believer is to really have that same realization of what is above, of what is in heaven, that it's of immeasurable worth. Because, folks, what is there is God Himself. He's our treasure. Psalm 73, 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. When somebody asks you a question, what's your good? How many of you, your first reaction is, oh, it's the nearness of God? I seriously doubt any of us say that on first thought. But the psalmist, that's, that's the way he ends that psalm. As for me, the nearness of God, that is my good. Or Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So folks, we're to seek we're to seek the things above, but we are also to, to set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And what that means is to, to, to set your minds is to, to give careful consideration. Make a decided and conscious effort to concentrate, to think about, to, to study, to ponder, to meditate upon. Now, why this command? Why these two strains, really, of the, of the same basic command, to seek and to set your minds upon? Because the fight against sin and the striving after holiness is serious business. And I dare say, every day, in various ways, you are pulled away from this. Whether occupation with work, with family, good things, things that can be good, and some things that aren't, some things that are just complete idolatry. <laughs> but we can be so pulled away from this. We need to have this kind of North Star that, that pulls us back and says, set your, seek the things above, set your mind on the things. Thomas Brooks was a Puritan who wrote a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And it's, it's a book packed full of just wise insight into the life of, of man on earth and our fight against sin. And one of Satan's devices that he elaborates upon is this. It, it's, it's that Satan makes the soul bold to venture upon the occasions of sin. So, makes the soul bold to venture upon the occasions of sin. And what he means by this is that we too often, we linger, we linger in places where sin is more readily available, okay? It makes us bold, makes us think we're strong enough. And, and he wrote this. He said, you may walk by the harlot's door, 
though you won't go into the harlot's bed. You may sit and sup with the drunkard, though you won't be drunk with the drunkard. You may look upon Jezebel's beauty, and you may play and toy with Delilah, though you do not commit wickedness with the one or the other. You may with Achan handle the golden wedge, though you do not steal the golden wedge. Now, the idea behind this, this device of Satan, is to convince us that we are strong enough that we are bold enough, and that just because we're around temptation, you know what, we're fine because we're strong enough and we're not going to fall. But Brooks Risley will have nothing to do with that idea. In keeping with Paul, he says, you can't do that. (laughs) Just plain and simple, you can't do that. You cannot linger on occasions of sin. He says, the shunning, the occasions of sin, renders a man most like the best of men. The shunning, the occasions of sin, renders a man most like the best of men. So if you know there's something, maybe there's on a road that you drive down that's a total temptation for you, in whatever way it may be, whether it's food or an image or a place, and you can get to work another way or get where you're going another way, the wise thing to be would go the other way. Don't think you're strong enough to just keep doing that. If there's things that pull you, you're not strong enough. (laughs) We need to shun sin. Whatever is unsound and unsavory and, and not right, we need to shun it like it's poison in our food. And that means not to think upon it, not to daydream or fantasize about it. So like I said, so, so practically say you have problem with images on the internet. Well, either get rid of the internet, don't get on the internet, or have complete protection. Set things up. Have a plan. If your heart loves material things and they turn away your heart from God, don't go window shopping every day. Don't have Amazon as your homepage. Delete the Amazon app from your phone. It's really common sense, folks, but it's hard. Avoid the temptation. Don't overthink it. But also, you can't leave it just at that, just at avoid the temptation. Don't think about that. Brooks wrote, It is best and safest to have the eyes always fixed upon the highest and noblest objects as the mariner's eye is fixed upon the star when their hand is on the stern. Have it set on the Lord as you walk through life so that that rudder of your life steers you in the right direction. Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Many years ago, I I read a short little book called The Life of God in the Soul of Man by a man named Henry Skugel. And Skugel himself lived just a short 28 years. And it was originally a letter written to a friend to explain Christianity and give spiritual counsel. And he wrote this, and it's a paragraph or even a a sentence or two that has, I think, the power to deeply affect your life. I I remember John Piper once said, he's like, "Um, books don't change me, paragraphs do. Because you don't remember an entire book, but you remember parts of it. And here's what Skugel wrote. He said, The worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. Just think about that for a moment. The worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. He who loves mean and sordid things does thereby become base and vile. But a noble and well-placed affection does advance and improve the spirit unto a conformity with the perfections which it loves. The images of these do frequently present themselves unto the mind and by a a secret force and energy insinuate into the very constitution of the soul and mold and fashion it unto their own likeness. 
So what we think about, what we set our minds upon will start to mold us to be like it. It makes sense. Like if, if somebody wants to, like we have this master class thing that you can kind of learn how to like, this guy Aaron Franklin taught how to smoke a brisket. I wanted to learn from him because he knew how to do it. There's uh, S- Stephen Curry has a class on how to shoot the basketball. If you want to learn how to shoot the basketball, he's probably much better than Doug. <laughs> Sorry. Or me, or anybody else in this room. Don't emulate us, emulate him. Focus on him, focus on what he does and learn from it. Okay? And as you do that, as you set your minds on that, you start to pick up those, you start to pick up the mannerisms and the, and the things. So we set our minds on the things. As you hang out with a friend, and a friend in college, we hung out, we'd start finishing each other's sentences because we just we became more and more conformed to one another. But I just love that thought that the worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. So if we were to weigh the worth of your soul, how is it? What is it that you love? Is it yourself and your comfort, your control, your way? Or is it God and His ways and His sovereignty and His goodness and His faithfulness and His kindness and His grace and His mercy and the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf for our sin? You see, what we love profoundly shows forth our inner being, our nature. But not only that, what we love and set our hearts and minds to changes us and molds us. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What that text is telling us is that as we behold the glory of the Lord, and the, and the veil has been taken off, the, the scales have been taken from our eyes for those who know Christ, as we behold Him, we are being transformed by beholding His glory. How that exactly works, I, I can't spell it out for you, but it does. We start to change as our minds and our hearts behold His glory and are focused on Him more and more. See, Paul tells us to love, to set your affections on, to seek fully to obtain the things in heaven. See God and his perfections and be transformed. Go with, back with what Matt said last week, right? Do not be conformed to the things of this world, but be renewed, you know, set, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But Paul gives further reason here in Colossians as well, and it's similar to what he has given elsewhere. Galatians 6.14, he wrote, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You've died. In line with what Matthew Henry wrote, and if we are dead to the earth and have renounced it as our happiness, it is absurd for us to set our affections upon it and seek it. We should be like a dead thing to it, unmoved and unaffected towards it. So Paul wrote, verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Three statements here that Paul gives as reasons for seeking the things above. One, you have died. Two, your life is hidden with Christ. And three, you will, pe- you will appear with him in glory when he appears. And as Henry said, believers have died. They have died to sin. Paul wrote this in Romans 6. And feel free to turn there. Romans 6. This is a chapter we should all be familiar with. Verses 1 and 2, and then I'll I'll go to verse 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Then verse 6. 
We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That language Paul uses, that we're dead to sin. The old self was crucified. Therefore, if we are dead and we have been raised with Christ, how can we let sin occupy our thoughts, occupy our hearts, occupy our minds? Because it's not who we are. And we have the power in Christ to flee sin, to pursue righteousness because of our union with Christ, because we've been united with him. Our enslavement to sin is over. And we have been given all the power we need to seek the right things. And truly, we don't belong to this world system. We belong to God. Our life is hidden with Christ and God. Now, what does Paul mean by this? I believe there's two primary aspects that he talks about here. First, that we are who we are because of Christ. Our lives are hidden with Christ and God. We're we're safe and secure with God the Father because we are in and with Christ. We are united to him. Our life is there, and it simply makes sense to be conformed to him in that way. But second, there's actually security in this statement. The, the, The image of being hidden has always carried the connotation of safety and security. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. We're hidden with Christ and God. As believers, we are more secure in Christ, whom we cannot now see than we are in any of the things in this world that we do see and that we hold on to so doggone tightly. They don't actually bring us security. The fact that we are hidden with Christ and God does. Finally then, we will appear with him in glory when he appears. Folks, Christ is going to come again. And come, Lord Jesus, come. He will leave his seat at the right hand of the Father, and he will return in tremendous glory. And many may scoff at Christ and his followers now and call us prudes and fuddy-duddies and and intolerant bigots on the wrong side of history. But on that day when Christ returns, his glory will be vindicated, and it will be manifested and revealed for all to see, and his followers will also be vindicated. Suffering judgment and scorn now for our occupation with the things of heaven is nothing in comparison to eternity with our Lord and Savior in his glory. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Philippian church. Chapter 3, verse 19, their end is destruction. So those who are away, who are fighting against God, who are pursuing their own things, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So just think about that. The mind set on earthly things, glory in their shame and our own destruction. And then he says in verse 20, but, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Folks, a glorious and spectacular future awaits those who are in Christ. So listen, these verses call us to something, to something greater than what we are so often satisfied with. Too often we pursue and are, are sadly content with the things of this world, but there is so much more for us. This message is all over Scripture, perhaps one of the more familiar, Matthew 6. 19 to 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in, in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
there will your heart be also. So where's your treasure? Our true treasure is in heaven. It's not here. We see glimpses of it here in other believers who know Christ in the church and the proclamation of the gospel. But our treasure is in heaven. Folks, even the greatest gifts we have received, family, friends, the treasure in heaven far outshines those. And it may be hard to comprehend, but it's something we must pursue. Too often, we are like the little kid who thinks there could be nothing greater than the joy of a swing. They giggle and laugh and love it more and more. And then they grow up and they think it's kind of lame. They learn to drive and they love it. Or they get on a roller coaster and they love it. And they think it's even more and more. And then maybe they learn to fly. And then they want to jump out of the airplane because they want that rush. And they just, everything keeps escalating. We are like that kid. We think some of the the pleasures we have on earth, nothing could ever top it. Heaven most certainly tops it. Life in Christ most certainly tops it. Chocolate is not the best thing you will ever have. (laughs) The joys of heaven are immeasurable. And if we focus on those joys, it will transform our hearts to not be content with the stubble that is here. And it will guard and protect us against the lure of sin and the lure of falsehood. Folks, we are called to something great As believers, we've been called by someone great, and that someone is telling us for our own good to seek him above all else. In him, we have everything we need for life and godliness. This is our new nature to love him, to look to him, to seek to obtain him and fully know all the benefits he gives us. As I've said, it's all too easy to be lured in and and to love the things of the world. even when we don't think it's love, but just honestly, just normal life can mute everything else and can mute our love for the Lord. But those things will not bring us happiness or lasting joy. And even lingering in our thoughts and desires on them can be dangerous. Hesitating around things that lure you brings with it occasion to sin, let alone the fact that where your mind and your heart are set, what your affections are upon will actually mold you into its image. So think about what lures you and why. What draws you to it? What is like that um, the light for, for the moth? What's that light for you? that just draws you to it. And for your good, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven with one eye than with two eyes not. And ask someone to help you with it you will not find happiness in what seeks to destroy you in the long run. Pray and seek God and seek his beauty. Jesus wants his joy to be fulfilled in us. As I read earlier from Psalm 16, there are pleasures forevermore with him. And Matthew Henry wrote, do we look for such a happiness And should we not set our affections upon that world and live above this? What is there here to make us fond of it? What is there not there to draw our hearts to it? Our head is there. Our home is there. Our treasure is there. And we hope to be there forever. So seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. It's for your good. It's for your joy. It's for the glory of God. Pursue it 
and pursue it with all your heart. Let's pray. Father, work in us this. It's, in some ways, it is such a simple concept, but yet it is so hard to execute. Because many of us, when we drive home, we will turn and start pursuing something different. Because it's just our habit, it's our commonplace. So by your Spirit, work in us, change us, root out that which is old and dead and deadening to our lives and draw us more and more onto what will change us from one degree of glory into another. And we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.